Okay, now we're going to go for the separate science only content. So let's go through our gas pressure, uh, Boyle's law, electric charge, uh, Van de Graaff generator, heat insulation required practical, the uses of radiation, and a little bit of fission and fusion too. So uh, gas pressure and Boyle's law, well we spoke about pressure a little bit earlier, but now just going on to a little bit more detail. The pressure and the volume uh, times by each other equals to a, equals a constant for a gas in a closed system. So what I mean by that is that for the same amount of gas in two different places under two different situations, the pressure times the volume is, is will be equal to the pressure times the volume in the other situation. Okay, so if we look at this here, um, our volume here is one litre and our pressure is 100 millimetres of, of mercury in this situation here. They decrease the volume, they push the lid down, they decrease the volume, or well the pressure times the volume will be the same number. As we can see here, the answer would be 100 for both of these. Um, and uh, that makes sense because this is going to have a higher, a higher pressure, we can see, of 200, and they've halved the volume there. Okay, so electric charge. Three ways, th three things we need to look at. Field lines from an isolated sphere. Isolated sphere just means a, a ball which is on its own, uh, like a Van de Graaff generator. Uh, charging an insulated rod with static electricity and how we make sparks. So an isolated sphere will have a le uh, field lines of an electric field. And if it's a positively charged, these field lines come out radially, they move away from it. If it's a negative charge, the lines will go in. So what rules can we make there? Well, the closer the lines, so in areas around very close to the, uh, to the uh, charged sphere, will have a stronger field. So the closer the lines are, these lines, the stronger the field. And the arrows always go plus to minus, so away from pluses and towards minuses. Okay, now if we were to bring together two negatively charged spheres, just like magnets, we would see all the field lines not crossing over, but pushing apart from each other. And we would receive, there would be a repelling force between these two. It would be physically difficult to bring those two things together. Equally with opposite opposite charges, just like in a magnet, uh, you would have the field lines going directly from north to south in a magnet. Here they're going from plus to minus. Okay, so charging an insulating rod with uh, static electricity, how do we do that? Well, you rub two insulating materials together. So friction causes electrons to be transferred from one, which then becomes positive, because uh, it's lost electrons, it's lost its negative charges, uh, from one insulator to another. And where the one which gains the negative charges will be, a, uh, will be negatively charged altogether. So the polythene rod is negatively charged, the dry cloth positively charged. So key words there, friction, electrons, transferred. And then identifying which one will become positive and negative. Okay, so how does sparking occur? How does lightning happen? Well, sparking or lightning occurs when a potential difference of voltage is big enough. Um, and you get a strong electric field. So this thing here, this, this field here we see up here, you get a strong electric field which strips electrons from the air around it. So all the air particles around here would have lost, um, would have lost electrons. And they would be pulled across um, and that would cause a current to flow. A current because moving electrons is current. Okay, so sparking occurs when a large voltage happens and it pulls electrons off of the air, causing it to uh, flow as a current. Okay, the heat insulation required practical. So this could be looking at the effectiveness of an insulating material, and all you would want to do is get some get something hot and let it cool down, but let it cool down with these different insulating materials on them. And we might be expected to measure the rate of heat loss, so how quickly the heat is being lost. If we need to do that, we need to take the temperature every 30 seconds. And a high rate of heat loss, as in a steeper gradient, if we have temperature against time, um, the, uh, the higher rate of heat loss um, will happen at the start because there's a greater temperature difference at the uh, uh, between the object and the surroundings. In other words, you put a hot pie into a freezer, it's going to cool down quicker than leaving a hot pie out on the table, as obvious as it sounds. Okay, so here's some examples of, um, of, of where heat insulation might be useful and what you need to know about them. So infrared radiation, thermal energy, um, that, that type of heat transfer will be stopped by shiny silver, it'll be reflected. 
it's an electromagnetic wave, and just like light, it can be reflected with a, so a shiny silver layer. Conduction and convection, as we said earlier, both require particles. So they can be slowed or reduced by trapped air, and they can be completely stopped by a vacuum layer. And why is that? Well, air is a poor conductor and can't flow if it's trapped. So by putting a plastic stopper on, that stops our convection because the air can't move. Um, having a vacuum between the walls um, uh, won't, uh, will stop the con conduction and convection because it doesn't have any particles in it. And you would need to save two things for that. So the vacuum has no particles and they both require, conduction and convection require particles. State those as two separate sentences. Okay, uses of radiation. Now there are there is always a small level of background radiation and it's mostly actually from natural causes. We can see over here that we get uh, background radiation from radon gas from rocks, from our food and drink, from outer space, from buildings in the ground, and uh, you know, a very small percentage, that's somewhere around 13%, is man-made. When we look at what that, that man-made um, element is, you might think it could be from maybe nuclear power plants, etc. Only a tiny amount is from that. Most of it is from medical uses, so hospitals treating cancers and, and um, medical traces. So taking a, taking a, a background reading, um, we would need to uh, subtract the background radiation reading from any uh, reading when we're trying to work out if something is radioactive or not. If you wanted to know whether this uh, green glowing rock was radioactive, first off take the background reading, point it at the green glowing rock, and then take away your background reading from that reading. And that will tell you whether the green glowing rock is, has got a higher uh, rate of radioactivity count rate than the background. So what professions are most at risk? Well, basically, because so much of it comes from outer space, people that hire up in the sky, so astronauts and airline pilots, but also people working in hospitals with this, with these medical sources as well, so your radiographers. Okay, fission and fusion then. Um, fission, uh, fission is a, a radioactive process uh, which is used to heat water in a power station instead of burning fossil fuels. So the fuels they use there are uranium and plutonium, and they'll have a large reactor, and inside this reactor they will have a large target nucleus like your uranium atom. They'll fire a neutron in it to make it unstable. You remember we spoke about that earlier. They'll fire their neutron into the target nucleus, and that will split into two smaller nuclei. It's going to release a load of energy, which is useful for boiling our water in the power station, and then it's also going to release more neutrons. Now those neutrons will bump into another target nucleus, and they will go on to cause a chain reaction. Now inside the reactor where this uh, chain reaction is happening, they will have some rods dipping into the reactor and they'll be held in place with electromagnets. And um, if we want to slow the rate of the reaction, we dip the rods in and those neutrons will go into the rods. So those neutrons will stop causing chain reactions and it will slow the reaction down to avoid it exploding like a bomb. Okay, so fusion then, if fission occurs in nuclear power stations, fusion then occurs in stars, and it's how all the elements in the universe are made. So this could be two small nuclei fusing together. In this example, these are two versions of hydrogen. They're hydrogen because they've both got one proton each, and they're isotopes of hydrogen. And the small nuclei will fuse together to make a larger nuclei and it's going to release a lot of energy in the process. And that energy is what we feel from the sun when we are out on a sunny day. It warms our planet up. So our small nuclei join together to form helium and a huge amount of energy. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the presentation, so thank you very much for listening, and best of luck in your exams.